Okay, so here we're going to talk about purine degradation and salvage. So this is part two of our talk on purines. All right, now, uh, as you may remember, uh, purines are synthesized using the precursor molecule PRPP. And there are multiple steps to get to our grandfather of purines, and that is IMP, inosine monophosphate. Now, inosine monophosphate can certainly go into making purines, but it's also part of the pathway of degradation. So in particular, AMP gets converted to IMP on the way of uh, degrading all the way down to uric acid, which is the end step. Now, AMP can also be converted to adenosine through an enzyme that you do not need to know. And adenosine can get converted to inosine. And this is a very important step. So you'll want to know adenosine to inosine and that this is done by an enzyme called, oops, sorry, adenosine deaminase. So that's adenosine to inosine. Now, inosine gets converted then to hypoxanthine. Hypoxanthine. All right. And again, an enzyme that you don't need to know. Hypoxanthine gets converted to xanthine. And xanthine gets converted to uric acid. Now, the enzyme that's responsible for these last two steps is an important one, and it's called xanthine oxidase, and it works at both of these steps. All right, now what about GMP? So we talked about AMP and how AMP ultimately goes to uric acid. Well, GMP does something similar. So GMP is up here, and GMP gets converted to guanosine through an enzyme that you don't need to know. And guanosine then gets converted to guanine which then ultimately goes back to uric acid, and then uric acid goes out through the urine. All right, so there are your steps. Now this is degradation. What about salvage? What does salvage mean? Well, salvage just means recycling. So like anything, when we're talking about recycling, we're talking about taking something that you're no longer using and converting it into something you can use. And the reason we wanna do that is to minimize waste. So if you have breakdown, you've got all these breakdown products, well, maybe you need to uh, make more nucleotides. And rather than going through that whole de novo synthesis pathway, you can take waste products and convert it back into nucleotides that you can use into making DNA. So the way that we do this is through an enzyme called HGPRT, and that stands for hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. And so just by the name HG, you know that uh, the, the two products that are used or the two reactants that are used uh, in, by this enzyme are hypoxanthine and guanine. So it is both here going from hypoxanthine to IMP and here going from guanine to GMP that we salvage our purines. Now, there you can go from adenosine to AMP, and that's a totally different enzyme, and it's not worth knowing because it doesn't get tested. So what does HGPRT do? It just takes that PRPP precursor and, sorry, and uh, it converts the hypoxanthine or the guanine to IMP or GMP, respectively. It gives off a pyrophosphate. That's not as important for you to know. What's important to know is HGPRT is the enzyme that's responsible for purine uh, salvage. All right, now why is that enzyme important? That enzyme is on the X chromosome and it is deficient in a very important disease. And that disease is called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. And that is X-linked recessive, so it occurs in boys. And we'll come back to the manifestations of that disease in a little bit. Now, there's another disease that involves this pathway, and it's here at this ADA enzyme. And this is called ADA deficiency. That's a good name for it, right? ADA deficiency. So they're probably not gonna tell you 
patient has ADA deficiency, what's the deficient enzyme? What they'll probably tell you is that you've got a patient who has got the manifestation of ADA deficiency, which is uh, a SCID, so uh, a combined immunodeficiency. And uh, usually in that setting, they've got a predisposition to viral diseases, bacterial diseases, fungal uh, diseases, uh, just the whole the, the, the whole plethora of, of opportunistic diseases very early on in life, first year of life. Um, and then what they may tell you is that the patient has an elevated adenosine. And you'll need to know that it's the ADA enzyme. Or they may uh, give you a patient with a severe combined immunodeficiency picture, and they'll give you this pathway uh, written out, and they'll put numbers on, you know, they might put like one here, two here, three here, or A, B, C, and they'll want you to know uh, which letter uh, or number in the pathway is blocked. So that's a way that they could give it to you. Either way, ADA deficiency is one of the more common uh, causes of a severe combined immunodeficiency. And this is an autosomal recessive disorder. Now, what about drugs? Well, the places where drugs really play a role here is in gout. So as you know, gout can be either due to an overproduction of uric acid or an under excretion of uric acid. So the idea behind giving drugs for gout is that we either want to increase the excretion or decrease the production of uric acid. And so one way that we can do that is by blocking this enzyme xanthine oxidase. And there are two drugs that do that. Allopurinol is the older one. And there's another drug that does that called Febuxostat. And that's on the market with the trade name Euloric. All right, so that is our purine degradation and salvage pathway. And uh, like I said, with, with all these pathways, it's good to memorize it. If you can do it, that's great. But what you really need to hone in on is where these diseases are and what, uh, what steps they involve and also the medications. Now, this is just uh, kind of an aside here, uh, but uh, I want to bring it up because we talked about it in our last talk on folate. Uh, so I want to point out here that methotrexate involves dihydrofolate reductase, and by blocking dihydrofolate reductase and reducing the amount of tetrahydrofolate, you reduce purine synthesis. Now, what are some other drugs that reduce purine synthesis? sulfonamides, and trimethoprim. Now, why do those not cause immunosuppression like methotrexate does? And the reason is because those only work in bacteria. They don't work so much in, uh, in eukaryotic cells. So there's an entire pathway that microorganisms use to synthesize their own uh, THF, and we cannot do it. We cannot take uh, precursors and make folate. Uh, so microorganisms can take pteridine and uh, PABA and ultimately go on to make folate and then go on to make dihydrofolate and ultimately tetrahydrofolate. And they do it through these enzymes called dihydropterate synthase and then uh, dihydrofolate reductase that is a little bit different because it's a bacterial form. And so the medications that are involved in this pathway are sulfonamides, which block dihydropterate synthase, and dihydrofolate reductase, the bacterial type, which uh, blocks is blocked by uh, trimethoprim. Uh, so this is why you commonly give trimethoprim and sulfa drugs uh, it, it, for uh, bacterial infections. So I just wanna bring this up kind of as an aside. Uh, if you watched the video on, uh, on purine synthesis, uh, this should be pretty relevant to you. Uh, but just know that those two drugs are also involved in the blockade of purine synthesis because folate is a necessary cofactor for purine synthesis.
This is just showing where the gout drugs work. So we talked about L-purinol and febuxostat, uh, but there are two other medications that are given for gout. One is probenicid that increases the amount of uric acid excretion. And then there's another one called rasburicase. And rasburicase is uh, a recombinant form of an enzyme called urate oxidase. And urate oxidase takes uric acid and converts it into something called allantoin. And allantoin is highly water soluble and it helps get rid of the uric acid in a way that doesn't raise your risk of forming uh, crystals in the urine. So it's basically just converting it into a more um, excretable form and that form is called allantoin. So urate oxidase uh, is not part of the degradation pathway as much, but it's an important enzyme because we can target it to increase our excretion of uric acid. All right, now let's talk about two disorders here. The first is gout. Now gout is caused either by an under excretion or an overproduction of uric acid. And most of the time it's due to under excretion. This is typically idiopathic, but what will happen is that because of the elevated levels of uric acid, you will have a deposition of monosodium urate crystals in the joints. And monosodium urate crystals, uh, regardless of whether they're in the urine or in the joints, they look like this. They're these negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals. So when these crystals deposit in the joints, they will cause an immune reaction, resulting in inflammation and they can also deposit in tissue and they cause this chalky aggregation um, that can be seen as tophi and this aggregation of crystals cause a fibrosis and a giant cell reaction pathologically. So what are the causes? As far as under excretion, it can be idiopathic. It can also be due to renal insufficiency where you're not able to excrete uric acid as you should. And so uric acid will accumulate in the blood, cause crystals resulting in gout. As far as overproduction, it can be due to myeloproliferative diseases. It can be due to tumor lysis syndrome when you give uh, chemotherapy and the cells have a rapid turnover. It uh, floods DNA and RNA products into the bloodstream, which ultimately get converted to uric acid and the kidney can't handle it. Um, and so you end up with, with crystals. And then of course, also Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. What are the risk factors? Anything where you're increasing your protein intake um, and then uh, alcohol, older and male sex. Okay, Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. We kind of talked about this. This is an X-linked recessive defect of the HGPRT enzyme responsible for purine uh, recycling. Remember that that takes guanine and converts it to GMP or hypoxanthine and converts it to IMP. Now, the big pathologic feature here biochemically is that these patients are predisposed to gout episodes. Why? Well, if you're unable to take guanine and hypoxanthine and convert it backwards into GMP and IMP, you're going to have a lot more hypoxanthine and guanine that gets converted to uric acid, and thus you're going to have increased crystallization, and you'll have the gout symptoms, etc. But these patients will also, for some reason, have neuropsychiatric features, and this will manifest very early on. Um, and because it's X-linked, you'll tend to see it in mom's brothers, in uh, male relatives on the mother's side. And so these patients will tend to have motor dysfunction, uh, intellectual disability, classically self-mutilation that is commonly thrown at you on the exam. They'll be chewing on their thumbs, chewing on their, uh, their knuckles, chewing on their lips, and they can have behavioral disturbances like aggression. So that's flesh nyhan syndrome. What you really need to know uh, for that is the enzyme and where it works.